If you would, please turn your Bibles to Galatians. As we finish this week our series on the fruit of the Spirit, this is our last, last week, our last fruit, that being self-control. Galatians 5 is where we will be. Uh, it has been a tremendous, tremendous blessing to look at this, at this chapter here at Galatians 5. So I will read verse 22, and then I'll read verse 23, and then we'll um, stop at verse 20, or after verse 24, and then I will pray. So Paul writes in verse 22, he says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, Gentleness, self control. Against such things there is no law. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Let us pray God's blessing over this time as we consider the truth of His Word. Oh God, we ask that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that we would understand the truth of your word, we'd comprehend it. I pray for each and every one of us who know you, oh God, who have come into your presence, have come into your new covenant through your Son. We ask that we would be sanctified, we'd be made more holy. We ask that we would be made, be made more pure and more righteous. Father, I pray if anyone who is hearing this or who is going to hear this has yet to see the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ at work in our life, who has yet to experience the saving grace of Christ, I ask that you would save them as they hear your truth being preached. And we ask, O oh God, that you'd be glorified in this time and in each of our lives. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for having redeemed us from the curse of the law. having saved us by your grace through faith in Christ. Oh, how we adore him and love him. <coughs> and how we praise you, Father. How we praise you for even allowing each of us to be here today. What a, what a privilege it is to, to worship you. We are in awe of your glory, in awe of your holiness. Truly, you are the God of glory. May you be glorified in all things through Christ. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Brethren, we find ourselves in a society, in a world that is undisciplined. It's full of undisciplined, ungodly people. They lack genuine, God-exalting self-control. Brethren, we are called to holiness and righteousness in the Lord, and that constitutes Self-restraint. That means that for us to be holy, we must have self-discipline and self-control, as we are looking at this morning. But as we find ourselves in this culture and in this world of wickedness that really despises any idea of a self-controlled person, a self-disciplined person, how do we keep ourselves pure? How do we protect ourselves 
from the nasty sewage that is found in the world system, which Satan is orchestrating, for he is the God of this age. He is the puppet master ordering the, the world system to deceive people and to bring about their ultimate destruction and their damnation. How do we resist this? How do we abide in the will of God? As James 1.27 tells us, that pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. That is the essence. That's the heart of genuine religion. To keep oneself from being stained by this evil world and a society and a culture that speaks ill of self-discipline. Or we can ask, or we can put it this way, how, how do we behave and conduct ourselves as the Lord Jesus, who was pure and self-controlled at all times? We will see these questions answered and others as we look at the Word of God, as we see the Scriptures, what they have to say concerning this truth. As we saw this morning in our Sunday school lesson, that even the London Baptist Confession says it well, that the sufficient rule of faith for the believer is the Word of God. It's sufficient for us and so when it comes to a matter like self-control and self-discipline in our lives, all matters pertaining to that, we go to the Word of God, which is the absolute standard, the ultimate standard. But let us first consider the context here of Galatians 5, as we have done each week, as, as every time we've looked at one of these fruits, we have been able to walk through the context to remind ourselves. That's what we have to do, brethren. Because we constantly forget. If you don't use it, you lose it. As the phrase goes. If we're not constantly reminding ourselves, here's what Paul's saying, here's what Paul's saying, here's what Paul's saying, we will quickly forget the context. And we can begin to misinterpret the text. And so we want to consider the context of the book of Galatians as a whole, Paul wrote it to the church at Galatia sometime around AD 50, so very early. And he covers the subject of salvation by faith alone, justification by faith alone. That we are saved. We are, we are brought into a right standing with God through, through faith in Christ alone. He defends that very, very thoroughly in chapters uh, 1 through 4. He also defends his ministry in the beginning. Two chapters as well against the Judaizers who had been attacking his ministry. For, for the Judaizers had come to the Galatians and said, Listen, you've got to be circumcised to be a true Christian. You've got to be circumcised to be a real follower of Christ. You've got to keep the law in order to be saved. And so Paul sets forth the doctrine of salvation by faith alone clearly, clearly in those passages. Then chapters 5 and 6, he sets forth the implications of that. What does this look like? How does this bear down on the Christian life? If we're saved by grace through faith, how does this look? And it is all centered around the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit's ministry in our lives, which brings about fruit, holiness, purity, consecration. It's all by His work. In fact, you could say chapter 5 is the Spirit's chapter in the book of Galatians. It's His work in us, in our lives. The key to understanding chapter 5 is this phrase, we're free from the law to fulfill it by the Spirit. We're free from the condemnation of the law, the weight of the law upon our shoulders, but to fulfill it in the Holy Spirit. It's an interesting 
interesting dichotomy presented in the New Testament. That yes, a believer is set free from the law, set free from its punishment, but we are free to fulfill it by the power of the Holy Spirit. God writes the law upon our hearts as He says to the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 31-33. He says, I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it. And they will be my, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's the new covenant. That's, that's the promise of the new covenant. One of the many promises of the new covenant. That God takes the law and instead of writing it on tablets of stone, writes it on the heart. The Holy Spirit puts that on the heart. And therefore the believer walks in obedience. Joyfully. As we see in verse 1 of chapter 5, Paul tells the Galatians, it's a very strong command here. Very, very, very strong. Listen to what he says, verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. We are to be free in the Holy Spirit. And then in um, a few verses later, in verses 13 through 15, he says, For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, in that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bind and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed. By one another. So again, the Spirit enables us to keep the law. And as we just saw in verses 22 through 24, and even in verse 16, that the command, the charge is walk in the Spirit. And what does that look like? Verse 23 and 22 both tell us that. For the one true believer, the Spirit-led believer, they will be self-controlled. And that's what we will look at now, the self-controlled believer. As he says there, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is, and then go down to verse 23, gentleness, self-control. It's clearly commanded that this is something we ought to be engaging ourselves in as we just saw in those verses selected here out of chapter 5. That's the command. We must be walking in self-control. In fact, he says in verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. That's not as strong as an imperative, but it still nonetheless is. In other words, if you claim to be a Christian, if you say you're going to walk by the Spirit, if you live by the Spirit, walk in Him. Walk in His power. That enables you to walk in obedience. But it's not just Paul who says this. This is the uniform, the complete testimony of the whole New Testament. 2 Peter 1, in verses 4 through 6, the Apostle Peter says these words. For by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. Godliness, self-control, moral excellence, they are tied to one another. Colossians 2, verse 5. Paul tells the Colossians, he says, Even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability 
of your faith in Christ. Paul exhorts Timothy in both his epistles. Both his epistles he writes to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 4, 7, he says, Have nothing to do with worldly fables, fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. He says, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Paul also puts it in the negative in 2 Timothy 3 when he's speaking of ungodly sinners in the last days. People who are outside of Christ, who are dead in sin. This is what he says about them. Verse 3. He says that they are unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control. Haters of good. So that's a negative. Jesus affirmed the need for this as well. It was absolutely necessary for Jesus to make this known, and He did. In relation to self-denial, He says in Matthew 6.24, If anyone wishes to come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. The task of self-denial, that is really the essence of self-discipline. To do that, you're, you're disciplining your own self. Brethren, we find ourselves obedient to this command to be self-controlled, self-disciplined, to deny the flesh. But how do we know that we are? What does this look like to be self-controlled? And that leads us to the next thing I want us to consider, and that is the, char the characteristics of self-denial, of a genuine self-controlled believer. What, what, is that, what is that characterized by? Well, firstly, it is Holy Spirit empowered. Holy Spirit wrought. He works this in us. As verse 22 tells us there in Galatians 5, it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's His work, His active ministry in the life of the believer is to bring about self-control. Among the other fruits as we have considered over these past few weeks, it is the fruit of His labor in our hearts. Our own strength is not sufficient. It's not enough to bring this about. Never is it sufficient. Brethren, is our own strength ever gotten you anywhere in your life as a believer? We find time and time again that when we seek to deny sin and deny the flesh and have self-control, we will fail immediately when we do it in our own strength and our own power. Because it's so little. It's so minuscule. And so it's easily drained and easily taken out. Therefore, let us rely on Him. The Spirit of God. The third person of the Trinity who is in us. And who is most glad to produce these fruits in us. As Matthew Henry, the Bible commentator, says in verse 23, uh, or uh, on verse 23, excuse me, commentating, he says these words, These fruits of the Spirit in whomsoever they are found, plainly show that such are led by the Spirit. That's how we know we're being led by the Spirit. Think about Paul's day as well. Think about what Paul experienced. Specifically in relation to the book of Galatians, with the Jewish legalists, the Judaizers, who had brought a form of, of work salvation, a self-propelling salvation. That you've got to, you've got to bring about your own salvation before God by your own performance. That would be the epitome of self-confidence. 
the epitome of self-trust. Of trying to do something in your own strength. Salvation cannot be obtained. We know that, of course. We know that, brethren. Salvation cannot be obtained by merely trying to earn it by your works. It cannot. Our works are not sufficient. They're imperfect. Imperfect. Paul had to address that with the legalists in at Galatia, the churches in Galatia. They were trying to please and obey the God of glory in their own strength, in their own strength, in their own power. They were trying to be holy by their own power. And what happened? It did not work. Jesus' most harsh rebukes, most scathing charges were always against who? The legalists, the religious, who had the thin veneer of religion, but inwardly they were ravenous wolves. They could not do what they said they could do because they did not have the Holy Spirit of God. That's why people who try to be religious or try to be try to behave like a Christian. They may have the outward appearance, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. They cannot please God. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you're lost. It doesn't matter how hard you're trying to be religious. If you don't have the Holy Spirit's indwelling power, you're outside of Christ. You're under the weight of the law. It's as if it is a yoke upon your neck. You're hunched over by its weight. Its condemnation rests upon you and you're waiting for the sentence of hell to fall. Don't burn in hell for your sins, but be saved through Christ. To be born again by the Spirit. Have His indwelling power within you. But it's only obtained by faith and faith alone. Secondly, I would like for you to consider and to contemplate this very truth, which is a hard truth. And this might be a little bit of a play on words. It's a hard truth, and that is it is hard. Self-denial is hard. It's something that is difficult to do. It's not easy. Being a Christian is not easy. In fact, it's hard. It's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to be a follower of Christ. Salvation is free. It's easy. You're justified in a moment by faith in Christ. It's all the work of God. He gets the glory for it. But when someone is saved, something changes. They go from being in the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of, of God's beloved Son, the kingdom of light, and they are there in the new covenant. But now they have three enemies. Three enemies against them. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And we find ourselves living in a world and living in a body that is against us. We, we, our own bodies are against us. Just always fighting against us. Fighting, fighting, and fighting. Rebelling against God. Our flesh is rebelling against God. We have to restrain that. That is so hard. That is something we will spend the rest of our lives mastering the art of doing. Of wrestling with the flesh and destroying, obliterating it, mortifying it. Whether it be getting up in the morning to pray earlier than most people get up in the morning. Whether it be to resist sexual temptation. Whatever it may be, we must be self-disciplined, self-controlled, self-restrained to bring glory to God. The narrow path of obedience is one that is filled with thorns, thistles, potholes, and sharp turns. And it is difficult. It is a very hard path to walk upon. Contemplate Paul for a moment. Think about Paul. He underwent intense persecution and he never fought back. He was 
willingly tortured for Christ. He himself testified in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 27, that he was in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. He says in verse 24, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. How did he do it? Without fighting or ridiculing those who were persecuting him. Or how did he even do it in those situations where he wasn't necessarily being persecuted by someone, but he was undergoing just hardship in the ministry? Things like he was often without food and cold and exposure. How did he even do that? By self control. Certainly was not easy. It certainly was difficult. Does any of that sound easy? Does any of that sound pleasant? I mean, I think sometimes when we look at Scripture, we just read things and we just overlook what he's actually saying or what the author is actually saying. Beaten times without number? Five times he received from the Jews 39 lashes? Astounding. Astounding. We are called to live a life of death. It's an interesting paradox. We're called to live a life of death. To live a life where we are daily dying to self. And it is glorious. It's weird. Isn't that interesting? People in the world, you know, they're living, they're living a life of death in another sense. They're just living, but they're inwardly dead. They're inwardly dead in sin. They're spiritually unable to react to stimuli. They cannot seek after God because they will not seek after God. They are haters of God. And so they're living a dying life in another sense. But then we find ourselves living a dying life in a much different sense. This outward flesh is decaying and dying. But inwardly we are being renewed. We are being renewed day by day. Paul said elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 9, 24-27, he said these words. He's speaking to the Corinthians and he says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath but we an imperishable. Brethren, we are going to receive rewards for our obedience to the Lord Jesus. So let us run the race knowing we're going to receive a heavenly reward. He continues in verse 26. Therefore run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave. So that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. There is a high stake when it comes to the Christian and self-discipline, self-control. There is a very high cost to not doing it. To not being self-controlled. Or brethren, we can even consider the martyrs. Think about all the brethren whom we have throughout the ages who have given their lives for Christ, who have gone to be burned at stake or, or crucified or stoned or whatever way they were killed. Or even brethren who are killed now in places like North Korea for being martyred for Christ. Consider their self-control. Consider the way they're able to control themselves in those final moments of life. Can we say this about ourselves? 
Have we holy restraint and self-discipline? Are we denying the flesh, brethren? This is our business. This is our chief business when it comes to battling sin. For here's the thing. The world is out there and Satan is out there. The flesh is here. In here. It's, it's inherent within us. We can never escape from ourselves. There are times when we are away from the world. We are set apart from the world. Praise God. And there are times when we know Satan is not upon us. And he is not unleashing upon our souls great affliction. But guess what? We always have there. Even in those most intimate times of prayer or our most precious times of worship or when we're studying the Word of God, the flesh is always there. The flesh is always there at war with our souls. And so it's inherent and it's imperative that we deny the flesh. Thirdly, it is naturally humble. Naturally humble. Genuine self-control, Christian self-control is naturally humble. See, to be, self, uh, to be someone who is self-controlled, it inherently assumes that you have something in you that needs to be held back. It inherently assumes that you have wickedness that you have to hold back. Otherwise, we don't need to be self-controlled. That's why, for example, when we consider the God, uh, the God of glory, the God of creation, we consider God Almighty. He doesn't need to be self-controlled. There's nothing he needs to restrain back. No evil he has to hold. He has no inherent evil. However, but when we look at the life of Jesus he did exercise self-control. We'll talk about that in a few more minutes. And that is because in his life, in his humanity, he was tempted. He was tempted to sin, but what does the Scripture say? He resisted. He was faithful. Praise God that he was. <clears throat> Brethren, you could, you could look at it like, um, by way of an analogy. Our flesh is like a vicious dog. We're holding it back with a chain. We're holding it back. We're restraining. We're just pulling on this chain. Keeping this vicious animal back. From doing what it so inherently desires to do. It's the automatic assumption. When a man is disciplined that there is something he needs to keep in check. We know that Paul also testified in Romans 7 18. He said, I know that nothing good dwells in me. There is nothing good in us inherently. And so we need to restrain that evil that is in our flesh. And that's why Paul even says in Romans 7 18, he said, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Our flesh and nature. There's nothing good about it. It's all fallen. But the Spirit is renewed, so by the power of the Holy Spirit, let's restrain the flesh. Let's hold it back. And most certainly, God is glorified and pleased in this. God is honored when we do this. James 4, 6 is clear. that It says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's humble ourselves, brother. Let's not think ourselves to be better than we are. To say, oh, you know I'm pretty mature. I don't, I don't need too much self-discipline in my life, self-control. Because I don't have too many struggles. If we think that, we're, we're in a dangerous spot. We're in a very dangerous spot. Much more than the one who admits they have struggles. The one who admits they have struggles and sees they have struggles and knows they have struggles and, and hates their struggles and is convicted over their struggles and tries to restrain that, they're in a much safer spot than the one who says, well, you know, I've been a believer for a while. You know, I'm, I'm pretty self-controlled already. Press on, brother. Let's push on to further holiness. Let us not ever be so proud to think that we are not in need of this. In church history, the most disciplined men and women were always the most humble. We're always the most humble. Those are inseparable. Humility and self-discipline and self-denial, they're always there together. Therefore, brethren, humble yourselves and be self-controlled. The 
next question that might arise when considering these things is, what are the results upon the life of the Christian? What are the results of this in the life of the believer? Well, many things come forth out of this. Many things come out of this. For one, is further consecration to God. Is to our Lord Jesus. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, he says that as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. In this we glorify God. We, we, we exalt His holy name. What else is worth pursuing other than holiness unto God? Is this found in you? Is this found in you? God, brethren, listen as God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. That's 2 Timothy 1.7. God's given us this. It's here. The Holy Spirit dispenses and grants that to His people. It's imminent. God has clothed us with power from on high. That's amazing. Amazing. Right now, we possess the power that Jesus promised His disciples in Luke 24 when He said that you will be clothed with power from on high. Not some mystical, charismatic, where we're performing miracles and we're just healing at will and we're receiving these private divine revelations. No, this is about genuine, practical holiness. What you always find in the modern charismatic movement, modern Pentecostal circles, is all the talk about the Holy Spirit, supposedly, and all the miracles and etc., etc. But you know what you find so little of among these people, among these preachers, these false prophets and teachers? Genuine holiness. In fact, I'd say it's a rarity. It's a rarity. It's a rarity. We see it all the time. Year after year after year, there are people, teachers, and these supposed apostles and these prophets, apparently, time and time again, sexual scandals, scandals of money, scandals of abuse of power, with lying, whatever it is in their ministries. Supposed ministries. It's because they're exalting something the Spirit does not even do anymore. His work in our lives, brethren, is to bring us into conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. That is the amazing power of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. It is not this weird, mystical subjectivism, but it is genuine holiness. This subjectivism to where everything's just I uh, brought an experience and an emotion. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And He brings the people of God into greater understanding of the truth so that they will be made like the one who is the truth, namely Christ. I would like us also to consider. Christ. Consider Christ. The perfect example of self-control. How can we speak of self-control? How can we speak of discipline and not speak of Christ? In fact, I would say, how can we speak of anything in Scripture and not ultimately go back to Christ? All roads lead to Christ when it comes to the things written in Scripture. It is always leading us back to Calvary. This is a life-changing reality. Because we're not led without an example. Christ is our example, brother. In His earthly ministry, He was the epitome of self-control. He's the perfect example for us. As the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4.15, 
For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. How astounding is that? The Almighty God of glory in human flesh tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Perfect in His self-control. And in His restraint of His power. Consider this, brethren. He's Almighty God. He can do whatever He wants. And there are times in His ministry, especially as we get closer to His death, and even as He's on that cross, He holds back His power. He restrains His power. He can call down legions of angels. How can this be? How amazing it is. Matthew 4, when Jesus is being tuned by Satan, those three times Satan comes and attempts him. Every time Jesus replies with the word of God, he, we, he yields the sword of the Spirit, and he stands firm, and he is restrained in self-discipline and self-control. And Satan departs. In Mark 14, when Jesus is standing to be tried by the Jewish people. And they're asking him who he is. And he tells them he's the Son of God. He's the Son of the Most High. And they declare that he had spoken, he had, he had spoken blasphemy. And there were people there falsely accusing him. It even says there that he, had, he was silent. He didn't reply to those rebukes. He didn't reply to those scathing words. But he remained self-controlled. With great patience. Oh, what great patience and self-control did our Lord have. Think of his time on the cross. Those hours there being mocked by the Romans and the Jews. Even those who were beside him, the thieves. One on each side of our Lord. Think about it as they're mocking him. This is the God who's created these people and who is upholding them. And giving them every breath they take and every heart beat that they have. And yet he's self restrained. He could have called down legions of angels, many myriads of angels, yet he did not. Furthermore, consider our Lord's prayer life. He had an incredible prayer life. It screams discipline. It screams self-control. As we find in Luke 12, it says that he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. That is self-control. I've never done that. I don't think I could do that in my own strength. And that is in Luke 6, 12. But we do have this encouragement. That same Spirit who enabled and empowered Jesus to fulfill His ministry and to fulfill the law and do everything He did was the same Spirit who dwells in us today. So we can do that. We can do those things by the power of the Spirit. Now, if you would, go back to verse 22 in Galatians 5. And we're going to look at that last phrase there that Paul uses after he says self-control. He says, against such things there is no law. And that is what I'm going to consider as we come to an end here. 
This is the last point I'd like to make in the last phrase of verse 23. This is a key to understanding the whole of chapter 5 in Paul's argument. We actually saw this at the beginning of the sermon when I was speaking about the context. He's summarizing the main idea of chapter 5, and that is that the Christian does not need the law to tell them to obey, to how to obey God. For they have the Holy Spirit inside them who has written it upon their hearts. That is the ministry of the Spirit. He has written the law on our hearts. We don't need the law. We don't need the law as this barrier around us. Instead, we have the Spirit who enables us to fulfill it without even us knowing it. Because He's written it on our hearts. And the Greek supports this idea. The Greek word that Paul uses there, the word against in the Greek is kata. And it's a preposition. It has, it has a lot of different translations in the Greek. But the translation is oftentimes determined with words like this from considering the context. What's the author's main intention here? And so the translators will consider that and, and make an accurate translation. And here I think um, against is helpful, but to go further to gain a better understanding what would help is um, the word against, the, the word kata here in the Greek can be translated according to, against, toward, or along, alongside of something. It kind of creates the idea of a wall or a guardrail. It's as if Paul is saying that the Christian does not need the guardrail of the law to keep them from sin or to make them righteous. If we have the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like bowling. You know, when they have those guardrails to keep it from the, uh, the, the little side lanes, the little pits uh, for the ball to fall into. They throw those things up when the kids play. It keeps the ball from going in. But we don't need that. We can just bowl straight in and hit a strike to go along with the analogy. We don't need that. And this is a little grounded in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31, verses 33 through 34. This is God promising the new covenant for Jeremiah. He says, But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. That's the new covenant. That's the new covenant. This is amazing because this is where we find ourselves today. In this new covenant. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That we're in this covenant. When someone is saved, when someone becomes a genuine, born again Christian, immediately will they bear fruit and they will walk in obedience. And no one has to tell them. No one has to sit there and say, you got to do this, you can't do this. They'll just do it inherently. I, I remember even in my own life, when I became a believer genuinely, when the Lord saved me, it was just immediate. It was just immediate, righteous living. And I could not tell you why. Eventually I learned from God's Word why those things are wrong. And why the things which I were doing were, was doing at that time were right. But the Spirit, before I even saw it in the Word, He had written it upon my heart. If this does not describe you, you're lost. If you claim to be a Christian and this never happened to you, you're lost. The Spirit hasn't written the law on your heart. If obedience to the Lord Jesus has not come naturally to you, and it never did come naturally to you, and you had to be told how to obey, and you've never learned of Him, you've never entered into the new covenant. Because the new covenant is not each man saying to another, Know the Lord. As God says through Jeremiah, they will all know me. It's by God's doing. Dr. John MacArthur said in his commentary on Galatians, on this passage, verse 23, specifically, he said, The believer who walks in the Spirit 
and manifests his fruit does not need a system of law to produce right attitudes and behavior. They rise from within him. I could not have said it better myself. of the Holy Spirit's ministry in the heart that these things come about. So in conclusion, we have seen that self-control, that it is commanded for us, it is something that God says we must have and we must possess. And we must not only just have it to an extent, but continue to grab more of it and have more and more and more of this fruit in our lives. We have seen what its characteristics are, some of the attributes of biblical self-control. We have seen the results upon the life of the believer. We have seen that Christ is the perfect example of self-discipline, self-restraint, and self-control. And he exemplified these things in his perfect life to the uttermost. And we have seen how we are free from the guardrail of the law. It is no longer necessary. In the sense that it must tell us what we must do. For that is the ministry of the Spirit. To write it upon the heart of mind. And therefore we can fulfill that law. Which we once lived in disobedience to. By his enabling grace. How amazing are these truths. But though we are commanded and exhorted. To have self-control. We still fall short. Even though we know in the new covenant that God enables us to fulfill the law by His grace, we still know that we are not perfect in that. That the flesh is still at work from time to time in us. In fact, it's constantly at work in us. And there's times that you, when it is, it is overpowering. Perhaps even seasons where the flesh is overpowering. And so we see that even us as Christians, we fall short. For God is perfectly holy, perfectly righteous. As Isaiah, in his vision in Isaiah 6, saw the, the angels in the throne room in heaven crying out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. God is perfect and pure to the uttermost, awesome in power, majestic in holiness. And He's given His law, He's given us His commands, those ones which were written upon the, the, the two tablets of stone, the ones which say, We shall not lie or fornicate, we shall not steal or covet, or we shall not worship any other God. And we know how we have trampled these underfoot. We have broken them. We have, we have transgressed the law. And if you're outside of Christ, you've transgressed the law. You've broken the law. You know you're a liar. You know that you're a thief. You know that you blasphemed God. You know you sinned. And because of our guilt before God, we are without hope, condemned to hell, outside of Christ, to the place of eternal torment, the flame which will never be quenched. And God will be perfect, perfectly just to do that. Yet in His mercy, He sent Christ, His Son. He sent Christ, His Son, to fulfill the law which we broke, as we've seen, in His perfect discipline. 
and self-restraint and self-control. He fulfills the law and then He goes to the cross and is stretched there upon that cross. And He satisfies God's wrath against sin. He undergoes the eternal punishment we deserve. And He is raised on the third day as the, the public display God had received His sacrifice. It was the sufficient payment. And after 40 days, He was seated in the glory. And that's where He's seated now. And the proper response to the Gospel, as we know, is to repent and believe. To flee sin and to trust the promise of God. If you repent and believe, you'll be saved from your sin. You'll be forgiven of all your sins because of Christ's atoning work at the cross. And you'll be clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be treated as if you lived Christ's life. He takes my sin, I get His righteousness. That's the greatest change of the gospel. Brethren, we know this. This has happened to us. And so let us never forget these truths. You notice every week I come back to this. Every single week. And I always will. It's because we don't ever need to forget this. And we forget it all the time. We always tend to revert back and go to a, a works righteousness for God. Try and perform our way. And so we need to preach the gospel to ourselves. The saints need to hear this. I need to hear this. Praise God that our sins are forgiven. Because of Christ's work at the cross. And we are clothed in His righteousness. We are accepted in the Beloved. As Ephesians 1 says. We are reconciled to God. If you're outside of Christ. You can be reconciled to God. Through Him. Brethren. Eternal glory awaits us. When we die we'll be with Christ. Or if the Lord chooses to return before we pass through the gates of death, then we will meet Him in the clouds. We will meet Him in the sky with all the saints at His glorious return. And this is all for the glory of God. God has ordered salvation to bring glory to His name. Come, you unbelievers. Come, you falsely converted. If, you're, if you see that you may, may claim to be a Christian, not have this self-discipline, this self-control in your life. The Spirit has never enabled you to walk in obedience, but you had to be told. You just have an outward trapping of religion. You just have an outward appearance of holiness, but not an inward reality. Be saved from your sins. And brethren, those who have been saved, let us rejoice and be glad in Christ's perfect work on our behalf. Let us rejoice and be glad that God in His grace has saved us. That the Spirit of God has raised us to spiritual life. Glory to God alone for all of this. For the truth of His Word, the life-changing truth of His Word, and for the gospel of grace, which soothes the heart. It is the healing balm of Gilead. It is the, the soothing milk, the, the nourishing milk, the, the, the rich meat of the word of the gospel that feeds the soul. Glory to God for all. Glory to God for all that He has done in Christ. Indeed, from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. It is to Him I say, be brought glory forever through Christ, His Son, who is the mediator of this new covenant. Amen. Let's pray. Precious Father, the God who has redeemed our souls, may we be holy and pure, Lord. May we be righteous. Father, may we grow in self-control and discipline. May we never forget the word of the gospel, but may we feed upon it day after day. And if anyone who hears these words, who has heard these words, is unconverted, I pray to bring them to saving faith in Christ this day. And Lord, work in our lives to the end that you might be glorified. Yes, Lord, for all, all for your glory. Work in us for your glory, O oh God. Indeed.
ye praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen, Lord. May you be brought glory in all things.